the King Institute for Faith and Culture on this early fall morning. I hope you've recovered from your disappointment in not seeing the big blood moon last night. I'm still, I'm still pretty upset about it. Maybe I'll last another 33 years, we'll see. It was on this day in 1066 that William the Conqueror of Normandy arrived on British soil. He defeated the British in the Battle of Hastings on October 14th, and on Christmas Day, he was crowned King of England in Westminster Abbey. The Norman invasion had a larger and more pronounced effect on the development of the English language than any other event in history. At the time of the invasion, the British were speaking a combination of Saxon and Old Norse. The Normans spoke French. Because the French speakers were aristocrats, the French words often became the fancy words for things. The Normans gave us mansion. The Saxons gave us house. The Normans gave us beef. The Saxons gave us cow. The Normans gave us excrement. The Saxons gave us a lot of four-letter words. <laughs> the English language has gone on accepting additions to its vocabulary ever since and now it contains more than a million words, making it one of the diverse languages on earth. We are pleased to have a poet and wordsmith with, with us today at the King Institute, Scott Cairns. Dr. Martin Dodderwijk will come up and introduce our guest. As you may know, Dr. Dodderwijk and I work together in the history department. I know French, and Martin studied British history. So you will know between us who uses house, cow, well, those four letter words. <laughs> those are the words most useful for introducing Scott Cairns. <laughs> introducing Scott Cairns is a tricky business. The standard list of accomplishments and positions is worth reciting gives us a sense of his scope and ability. And here goes. Scott has published eight books of poetry, a memoir about to go into a second illustrated edition. He gets pictures. Nobody gets pictures in a book. This is great. <laughs> Two libretti for oratorios. He's won fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation and the National Endowment for the Arts. Last year, he won the Denise Levertov Prize for poetry. He's taught at numerous universities, currently at the prestigious writing program at the University of Missouri. Um, it's an impressive list. And it should adjust your seat posture to hear something learned and brilliant. Be ready to sit at attention. On the other hand, this list leaves out the fire. Scott's poetry is award-winning and skillful. It is also a soul's window to the life of seeking God, to love, to pain, to joy. Each word, both light and weighty. Years ago, I heard an interview with Scott uh, on Mars Hill Audio, and he cited something about the way that words invoke in themselves their whole history as you use them. And it has struck me ever since, the sense that words are more than we think they may be. His poetry has been described as a flesh-made word. In his preface, the new volume, Slow Pilgrim, which we will have for sale. Richard Howard says this, Cairns is the singular poet in this age of our country who has not seen fit to oblige his poetry to serve his belief, nor his belief to serve his poetry. It is one grown-up mind we read, one man's voice we hear, a contingency which makes it absurd for me to speak of service in either direction, for in these poems there is but one direction, inward. For the fire of what Scott has to say, your posture should also keep you on the edge of your seat, <coughs> ready to hear the sudden insight, the moment of illumination. But that list still leaves out the cool. One interviewer said this of Scott Cairns, that to interview Scott is to serve as his straight man. It is also the case that I have witnessed this cool myself. Somewhere in the early 2000s, I don't remember the year, I got to hear the poet's voice giving uh, in lusty melody the phrase, got my mojo working, <laughs> as we attended a James Cotton concert together. And then, 
thrown out uh, as if uh, cast to the wind, some deep cut Van Morrison lyrics on Beale Street that I happened to recognize. I have never felt cooler in my life. <laughs> and will never again. We may as well concede that. I do have the four letter words that don't have to And so your posture should include not only not only the seat back keeping you at attention, not only the edge of the seat for the special moment, but also something to lean back on, the occasional laugh, the knowing nod, the moment of special insight. And so I can't really introduce him. I can simply say, here is Scott Cairns. Of your upbringing, 
and education. You might also have had a sense of vocation as a calling to service, a circumstance in which the called woman or man is is beckoned by the Holy Spirit to a place where an occupation by which your talents might be enlisted in the reconciliation of the world. I still think that this idea of service, of serving another, may be part of how a vocation operates. But I no longer believe it to be the heart of the matter. In a subtle sort of corollary, it seems to me that most of my students, when they first come to my classes, have a sense that their poetry is something that they do to serve others, something that they do to share with others certain discoveries they've made, opinions they hold. They understand initially, until I slap them, <laughs> their poetry to be something they do to share what they know. The poems of these beginning students are understood by them, therefore to be vehicles, merely a means of delivering previously comprehended matter and the purpose of their poems, as well as the purpose of all other poems, so far as they can tell, is presumed to be one of transporting something known from one person to another. Well, it's possible that this transfer of static goods from one mind to another may be part of poetry's oblique operations, but I no longer believe such action to be the heart of that matter either. In any case, expressing what one knows is certainly the least interesting part of the creative process that yields poetry. One of the reasons I first fell in love with poetry was the sense I had that a great poem could not be reduced, or rather should not be reduced, to a paraphrase, nor to anyone's interpretation of its meaning. A great poem is always capable of saying more than we have yet heard from it. And that's why we keep them around, why we read them again, and again, and many times over. And even one's own poems, understood this way, if they are actual poems, present this essential mystery of gazing upon what seems to hold more than one can name. Of course, I can speak now and ever only from my own experience, but I would say that my poems taught me far more than they are likely to have taught anyone else. I know that they have led me, albeit in fits and starts, from one, from the childish, besieged, and brittle, frankly untenable faith of my youth, through more thoughtful, more productive cycles of faith and doubt, and have led me more recently to a relatively more calm and a profoundly more joyful disposition of a willing, eager, almost giddy apprehension of God's nearness. To be sure, my poems became orthodox before I did, and they led me to my embracing the fullness of our common faith. That is to say that whatever my poor poems may have said to others, however the poems often on may have served others, they served me first, and they served me in the very process of my making them. They led me word by word, line by line, poem by poem, into suspecting the incomprehensible presence of God, the inexhaustible one might say, the unrelenting love of God. And that is, I would suppose, how artists of any art eventually come to understand their undertaking. Less as a means by which they communicate something they think they already know, and more as a process by which they come to apprehend what they do not know. Perhaps what they can never exactly know, but what, in exhilarating joy, they slowly come to suspect. So it's therefore very misleading for us to speak of any genuinely literary writing in terms of expression alone. While our productions may begin with a desire to express some matter glimpsed, along the way the process of composition must become, must be understood primarily as a way to see, as a means of apprehension. So let's go back to vocation for just a second. And those of you who are dozing off, wake up, this is, a, this is the important part. I've come to see that a vocation is not so much a chore as it is yet another in an array of countless blessings a loving God pours out on his beloveds. 
granted, when we pursue our vocations, we are serving others and we are serving God, but I now see that a vocation also is to be understood and probably primarily understood as yet another way that God ministers to us, another way that God reveals his love for us, another way that he enables us to glimpse his abiding presence, even as he gives us these particular means by which we may partake of it. Calling us to a vocation is how he provides us with something substantial, something worthwhile, something necessary to do. Prayer, it seems to me, is a similar gift, and it is one that I must confess I spent most of 40 years squandering. I say that it was in my 40th year that I finally began to pray. Most of us suppose that we know a thing or two about prayer, even if prayer has yet to become an unceasing activity, which if you'll recall, it's supposed to be. We know that we should pray. We know that prayer should be a daily part of our lives. In terms of models for this behavior, we surely witnessed countless occasions of public prayer. We've no doubt spoken countless prayers alone. Regardless, if this dis disposition of prayer as expression or as petition merely is all we know of the matter. I and the, and the fathers and mothers of our church would say we have yet to begin. I think, it, I think the last time I was here I mentioned this episode as well, but years ago I, I, I happened to be watching a CBS television interview that alerted me to my own long-standing trouble in the acquisition of prayer. The then correspondent, Dan Rather, was interviewing Mother Teresa of Calcutta. I don't know how many of you were blessed enough to have witnessed that. At one point, Mr. Rather said something like, Mother Teresa, you're a woman of prayer. What is it that you say to God when you pray? Mother Teresa answered, I don't say anything. I just listen. And Dan Rather then asked Mother Teresa, what is it that God says to you during prayer? She replied, He doesn't say anything. He just listens. <laughs> Something about that paradox startled me, shocked me by its rightness. I'd say it shocked me awake. For the first time in my life, I had a glimpse of prayer as communion, as mutual loving attention. One of my favorite theological writers, Paul of Dogimov, characterizes the process like this. He says, it is not enough to say prayers. One must become prayer. Prayer incarnate. He writes further, a saint is not a superman, but is one who comes to discover and live his life, his truth, as a liturgical being. A saint is not a superman, but is one who discovers and lives his truth as a liturgical being. I don't presume to have become a liturgical being, but I would say that I have come to see that this condition is possible. I've come to see that it's not only possible, but desirable. And I would now say that it is what each of us is called to become, a liturgical being. Virtually all of our liturgies, and even the orders of worship in what we would think of as less liturgical or non-liturgical churches, derive from what we in the Eastern Church know as the divine liturgy, a prayer service, comprised of essentially dialogic language in which a priest or a deacon speaks and is answered by the congregation. During the course of that dialogue, it becomes clear that the conversation is not exactly between the clergy and the people, but between the entire gathering and their God. This is a bit harder to glimpse in the Western Church, where the altar has been turned around to face the congregation. But as you may know, in the Eastern Church, the altar still faces the East, and both the priest and the people face East. Uh, turn together to address God in worship, a worship that is also known as the prayer of the church. 
and most revealingly known as the work of the people. Prayerful worship is therefore our common vocation, our common calling, our common employment. I can guess how a continuous life of prayer must register with some of you, as if I'm saying we must each abandon our lives, our loves, our pleasures, in order to become some species of monk or nun. I'm not saying any such thing. As it happens, I do spend a good bit of time each year with monks, and while I admire their particular martyrdom, I'm, I'm fairly certain that their life is not one to which I have been called. Thank God. In any case, I am suggesting that our lives, our loves, our pleasures all be pursued in the presence of God. Everything we do, pursued in the presence of God. Of course, everything we do is in the presence of God. The issue is that the one who has made prayer her life becomes incre increasingly conscious of God's presence. Increasingly conscious both in terms of frequency and in matters of degree. He or she comes increasingly to attend to that holy presence even as that holy presence increase, unceasingly attends to him or her. I'll get up the script for a second just to remember that there was a time when I was a young, ambitious uh, graduate student uh, who was angry all the time. I, I, had a, I don't know where it came from. I had a very blessed life. Quite honestly, I've been blessed with uh, a beautiful and fairly painless life and uh, for which I'm grateful. But there was a period of my uh, time in my more ambitious years when I, I got a little angry and impatient and, um, you know, if someone, had ins if someone were to insult me, uh, I, you know, I'd have to get right about it and correct them and say, no, 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 you're, you're the one that's insulted. Right. And, and, um, but as I started doing the, performing the Jesus prayer as a practice, uh, saying this prayer uh, constantly, I, I became increasingly aware of God's presence. Uh, it, it, without even my noticing, th that anger all evolved. It kind of transfigured into embarrassment, which you might not think is such a good thing, but it was a great improvement from my position. Um, so instead of being angry when someone insulted me or offended me or said something or did something that uh, I thought was uh, untoward, um, instead of being angry about it and wanting to sort of correct the person, I just sort of felt embarrassed for him. Because uh, I, once you start to realize God is attending your every moment and you start to live that way, even the offenses become something that you know he sees as well as you. You don't need to be angry. You can be a little embarrassed, feel a little chagrin for the poor a uh, sucker who doesn't seem to realize what he said to and to whom, in, in the presence of whom. It, it, it really had a profound effect on my disposition. So now you can see I'm just an absolutely delightful. Uh, back to poetry for a moment. My Christian students, my Christian students, when they come to think of my classes for the first time, tend to see their poems. This doesn't last for long either, by the way, because. I slap them out of this quickly. But they, they tend at first to see their poems as opportunities to proselytize others in the community or at least others in the class. Most often to proselytize me. Um, students of a more secular bent tend at first to see their poems as opportunities to correct certain political blindnesses suffered by the community or by others in the class or by me. As I've suggested, vocation it lately occurs to me, is primarily a gift to the called. It is a blessing, a particular means by which the called man or woman will thereafter apprehend the subtle realities of creation and its relation to its creator. Once we accept this gift, we are less likely to perceive a vocation, any vocation, simply as a means by which a man or a woman expresses something already known. Some of you may be poets, and some of you may be musicians or painters or sculptors, pursuing any number of arts. 
perhaps some of you are thinking, have been persuaded to think that any such artistic pursuit is not altogether expedient, or that any such pursuit is in keeping with our faith only insofar as it is directly, dogmatically, one might say apologetically, tied to an expression of the faith, only insofar as it serves to encourage that faith in others. More likely, some of us have been persuaded to think that the pursuit itself is more than a little selfish and justifiable only as a hobby. I'd like to suggest a different take. I want to insist that the pursuit of art, or any of our vocations, actually does become worthless when it is pursued as a hobby. The pursuit of art also becomes worthless when it is pursued as evangelical apologia. And that the pursuit of art becomes utterly worthless when it is reduced to being the expression of what we know or what we think we know. On the contrary, I want to insist that the pursuit of art becomes a vocation only when it is understood as a discipline, a devotion to a way the medium of language or of sound or pigment or clay or fabric, the stuff of one's work, of one's art. A devotion to a medium, a craft, whose pursuit leads the artist into making something worthy of attention. If our, if our constructions are sufficiently well made, they may prove worthy, moreover, even of repeated attention becoming scenes of ongoing meaning-making for ourselves and for others. We must not fear that our wholehearted pursuit of vocation will lead us away from our duty to God or to family or to community. The opposite is true. Wholehearted pursuit of a vocation manifests a mature faith, genuinely trusting in the God who called us. Wholehearted pursuit of vocation enables us concurrently to pursue and fearlessly our duty to God and to our families and to our communities. In this light, vocation comes to be understood less as a line of work and more as a mode of being, less as an expression of what is known and more as a way of knowing, less as something done to deliver a message to others and more as a way God reveals to us who we are, who He is, and how we are, all of us, connected in prayer. Similarly, I'm starting to, to suspect the degree to which prayer is a condition of being rather than a momentary expression. I'm beginning to see that prayer is a mode of life, a developing awareness of our being always and ever in the presence of God. I generally resist the temptation to blur distinctions between poetry and prayer. Still, given the fact that such blurring continues to come up in conversations I have inside and outside of the classroom, the relationship between the two activities may warrant a little more attention. So one difference, I, I can think of one difference between my poetry and my prayer, but it's pretty obvious to me that when I pray, I'm confident I have an audience. <laughs> <laughs> Regardless, whereas poetry is necessarily a public utterance, prayer is an essentially personal utterance, an intimate contact between persons. Even so, poetry and prayer are similar. They appear to share a number of substantive qualities. Both have been characterized as arts. Which is to say, I suppose, that both can be done well or less well. The degree to which they are done well is manifestly enhanced when these practices are understood as just that. Practices, disciplines. The more time one puts into them, the more accomplished one becomes. And the more efficacious the result. Moreover, I think that accomplishment in prayer, like accomplishment in poetry, or in any art has to do finally with attaining an uncommonly acute habit of attention. Attention of an increasingly powerful poet's poems help her to see what could not be otherwise seen. 
person's prayer helps him to hear what cannot be otherwise heard. So what is it that we are to do with our work, with our relationships, our lives, our prayer? I suppose we must take them seriously, honor each as having intrinsic or substantive value of itself, honor each as partaking of the real, the holy, honor each moment of our lives as if our choices mattered, as if the art we make, the people we face, our every response to them is participating in powerful and visible ways with the present. And in that participation is collaboratively shaping the future, which isn't written yet. A great deal is writing on how fully or how poorly that we, through our vocations, become like Christ. So get busy. I'm going to read one more little thing. Suppose the Holy One we, whose face we seek is not so much invisible as we are ill-equipped to apprehend His grave proximity. Suppose our fixed attention serves mostly to make evident the gap dividing what is seen and what is here. The book there on the shelf, on the stand, let's say the stand, it is on the stand, proves arduous to open, entombed as it is in layers of accretion, layers of gloss applied to varied purposes, hardly any of them laudable, so many guarded ploys to keep the terms quite still, predictable which is why I'm drawn to, why I love the way the rabbis teach. I love the way they read, opening the book with reverence for what they found before, joy for what lies waiting. I love the word's ability to rise again from chronic, homiletic burial. Say the one is not so hidden as we are kept by our own conjuncture, blinking, puzzled, leaning in without result. Let's say the meek, the poor, the merciful, all suspect his hand despite the evidence. As for those reverenced folk, the pure in heart, intent on what they touch, they see him now. Blessing of strength be with you. Go with blessing. 